America's first hospitals were safety net hospitals. Bellevue in New York, a charity in New Orleans. These were the first hospitals in America. And back in those days, you know, wealthier people didn't go to hospitals. The doctors came to their home to take care of them. You know, poorer folks first went to the almshouses and then went to these dispensaries that later became the hospitals. The modern American hospital is based on those places. It's based on the safety net. Our members really created that model 200 years ago, more than 200 years ago. All these hospitals have a common origin. They were places for poor, recent arrivals in whatever city it was to get care. And what care in those days meant was a relatively clean bed, three meals a day, uh, some comfort. There weren't very many effective therapies. Uh, and so these large city hospitals came into existence all with this common background. Uh, and, in, and in Boston, uh, it was uh, people streaming in from the countryside to take up jobs in ports or in the, the households of the richer people. It was immigrants from outside the United States, Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants, Polish immigrants. Uh, they were the people who the public hospitals served and to a major degree, the public hospitals and the big city hospitals have always been the place that first took care of whoever arrived most recently. And I think that that's probably still true. And uh, because in those days, uh, the question of, uh, that was in the old discussions of Boston City Hospital, would people of means go among the poor to be treated? And people of means never went to hospitals until hospitals began to have clinical differences in the outcomes. And then everybody else started using hospitals. If you're really looking directly at NAPH and where it came from, you have to go back to the Medicaid and Medicare programs in the mid-60s. There are more than 18 million Americans over the age of 65. Most of them have low income. Most of them are threatened by illness and medical expenses that they cannot afford. And through this new law, Mr. President, every citizen will be able in his productive years when he's earning to insure himself against the ravages of illness in his old age. This insurance will help pay for care in hospitals, in skilled nursing homes, or in the home. Because when they were adopted um, and, and, and put into effect fairly quickly, much more quickly than Obamacare right now, uh, there was the theory that it, at least those public hospitals that were serving as a safety net for the poor or the elderly who were now going to have coverage would no longer be needed. By the 70s, there was a growing group that said, wait a minute, you know, that number one, Medicaid isn't covering even half of the poor. Uh, in fact, Medicaid actually, before the child health program was enacted, Medicaid reached its high point in about 1975 in terms of the percentage of low income, you know, under poverty, people who were covered by Medicaid. And it was really downhill after that ever since. Uh, the National Association of Public Hospitals really came into existence because a few of us felt that the American Hospital Association, a wonderful organization all by itself, didn't quite represent the public hospitals uh, as a group. Uh, and there were some important differences, and we had different needs. For example, uh, reimbursement for the disproportionate share of people uh, without insurance that the public hospitals took care of. So really, it was uh, an attempt to create a club of our own. Uh, and uh, we would go to these larger hospital meetings and we'd look at each other and we'd listen to what they were talking about. Uh, and we would wander off and say, you know, that's all very nice, but that's not what our issue is. Uh, so a representative from New York, where there were major public hospitals, got it. Representatives from Texas, where there were major public hospitals, got it. But in places where there were no public hospitals, remember, there were, I think then, maybe 125 
serious public hospitals. There were other uh, county districts and things like that, but uh, it was a pretty small club. And so most of the members of Congress didn't have a clue what they were talking about. Uh, and so it was to Larry's good credit that he went around the Congress educating people as to what this important element was. And as people began to realize that these were the places where the bulk of the next generation of doctors were being trained, and that these were the places where there was a lot of research going on, uh, they began to understand that there was something important about this resource. But at the beginning, I think they had no, not a clue. The public hospitals uh, didn't have to have a case made for them. They were created for people uh, that were poor, that didn't have the ability to pay for health services. And for many, like myself, the emergency ward was our family doctor. I had no idea that they never thought about having different problems in private hospitals. And so uh, when they got together, they had better conferences. They were sharing common problems. I was so pleasantly surprised when Larry Gage not only agreed with me, but became excited about the prospect of organizing the public hospitals in a way that their story could be told and not in conflict with other hospitals, but just to show that they needed a different pair of eyes to look at a different set of problems that public hospitals had. And so we founded the Public Hospital Association. So we often say our work is grounded in essential people, essential communities, essential hospitals. And there's a reason why the people are listed first there. Our patients are at the heart of what we do. We wouldn't have hospitals, we wouldn't have our organization if there weren't patients to serve. And our members will tell us that you can't reduce their patients to numbers or statistics or check boxes, but it's the stories behind those people that makes them individuals and makes them unique and makes them part of the essential communities where they live. I do believe there's a certain, um, almost magic isn't the right word, but just there is something creative that's unique when you bring together leaders from around the country who share this deep mission and commitment to the patients that they serve and why they do the work that they do. When you get those folks in a room together and they are not only sharing their challenges and their ideas for solutions, but they are really thinking about how do we move this whole system forward in a way that's completely mission-centric? That is unique. How do you care for people who have you know, multiple social issues and mental health issues and who may not be covered by health insurance? Uh, those are the sorts of problems which our members not just you know, take on, but they, they, they are honored to take on. Um, they feel that it's really you know, something which you know, they wake up in the morning wanting to change and wanting to make better. In so many of these communities, you know, these hospitals are the places where people from miles around come to get things they can only get at that hospital. So that was very important to send that message that would, in the minds of policymakers, and that's really who our audience is at the end of the day, would begin to understand that these places are different, that they are essential. Because we ended up with a, a pretty significant legislative victory within the first year, basically, even though we didn't know how significant it was going to turn out to be. As almost everybody knows, an awful lot of work on Capitol Hill is done at the staff level. Building good relations with staff is critical. I think one of the things I always felt best about was um, sometime in the mid-1990s when we were in the midst of a very intense debate, a staff member on the Hill, a Republican staff member, whom we fundamentally disagreed with on a lot of issues, 
said to me one time, I always enjoy working with you. And I was like, why? <laughs> because we don't agree. And he said, because every time I call an APH, I get an answer, I get a factual answer, and APH knows its data, knows what its position is, and I really appreciate the honesty and the data you give me. It's a little bit of a sad commentary about Washington, D.C., that being honest and having the data is considered wonderful. <laughs> but I think NAPH has always prided itself that it can give answers to everyone, will meet with everybody, talk to them about what we believe. I think that one of the real evolutions we've seen in healthcare delivery um, really over the past decade, but culminating in the last few years, is that it's no longer possible to separate advocacy from the actual work that public hospital systems do on the ground. There was a time when those were really sort of two separate endeavors, um, but as we really link um, how we deliver care, the quality of care that we provide, the amount that the patient is put at the center of that care with how we pay for care, what our expectations are as a nation for our healthcare system, what policymakers are seeking in terms of reforming the healthcare system. You just can't separate policy and advocacy from the actual work and care that public hospital systems provide. And what the Institute, I think, does and why it's so been incredibly important, but actually its value and importance to the work of NAPH is only increasing, is because NPHHI helps bridge those two worlds and really creates a space and an opportunity that I think demonstrates the commitment of the members of NAPH to truly improving and transforming the care that they deliver so that they are at the leading edge of providing high quality care that truly makes a difference, not just in the healthcare, but in the actual health status of the patients and communities they serve. Another one in the early years was a program funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It was in the early years of AIDS, now HIV AIDS. Um, RWJ realized that no one knew exactly what was happening in hospital-based care, and yet NAPH members were some of the training grounds around the country. The pioneer work done by San Francisco General is still cited around the country. And so RWJ gave NPHHI a grant. It was published, it got wide national publicity when it was first published on that pioneer work into something that now has become mainstream medicine. It wasn't mainstream medicine um, back in the early 80s. And so it's again another credit to NAPH and the Institute that we were able to help clinicians around the country in the care for those people. And we were the providers that really stepped up to the plate. And there were providers in the private sector that wouldn't even be willing to see these patients, but the public hospital systems with their, their uh, commitment to vulnerable populations, regardless of their ability to pay, uh, stepped up. For example, the Harris County Hospital District, Bernal Harris Health System, uh, we, through uh, uh, our commitment to our community, opened up the first freestanding community-based AIDS clinic in the nation. And I'm very proud to say there were many of, several members of our association that did come down to Houston. They came to Texas in the heat <laughs> and, uh, and looked at our system and looked at what we had done. I understand we've got some, some business to do with your family. Uh, yeah. Mr. Denson is a patient who has AIDS. I felt the students need to know him as a person so they understand the illness of AIDS. I just want to be able to uh, be sure that we don't um, be a bull in a china closet or anything like that. And, and is there anything special that might help us understand how they're going to react to this news? In so many ways, I'm thinking that they do know, you know. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, they're just waiting on me to come out and say it, you know. I've sensed through the years watching people take care of AIDS patients that sometimes they stand at the end of the bed. And sometimes they, they have their hands in their pocket. I saw you walking down the hall and moving around, so I know you're on, you're on automatic pilot here. I think we beat out of our medical students a lot of the compassion and the empathy and things they need to understand the person. I want them to be able to make eye contact with him, uh, to touch, uh, to examine. So what was very confusing to all of us at the time uh, was that an infection can cause cancer. You know, 
for example. So infections were done by infectious disease people, cancer was done by oncologists. So I remember when the epidemic first came into the homeless community and the poor community, um, Boston City Hospital, almost a medical center, really did what I thought was one of the most creative, and now that I think about it, um, far-seeing collaborations where they understood that AIDS was breaking all the boundaries. So you needed dental care, you needed cardiac care, you needed kidneys, because the, the, the and virus was affecting all of those systems. So they set up an AIDS clinic. I remember we were part of this. It was a blessing for us to be part of it, where the specialists and the primary care docs all got together in a single spot to care for the person who had all of these things. And it was the first time I had ever seen the boundaries between departments and between professions really evaporate. Um, and it was all focused on how do you care for the person in front of you. So what I think today about this, the, the emphasis on patients in a medical home, the, uh, you know, the emphasis on coordination of care, this was all presaged in this remarkable clinic that the city hospital had um, uh, here in 1985 and 86. Uh, and we learned a lot from that. By being part of that, we learned a lot about what we needed to do for the care of the It was very, very, very interesting. Of course, extraordinarily tragic in the beginning when everybody we took care of died. And then to be part of a world when the care got better, the medicines got better, and now AIDS has been transformed into basically a chronic disease. It's really remarkable. As you might suspect, the biggest supporters were the hospitals. And it was more of an indirect insurance. You showed up compassion to treat people that can't afford. And the federal government would try in some way to compensate you for the disproportionate share of poor people that you've taken care of. Disproportionate share, dish. The dish fights over the years have always been interesting because there frequently have been points where we didn't agree with the rest of the hospital community because frequently we were trying to target payments to the highest volume providers of care, which aren't exclusively, but are vast majority the NAPH membership. One time when we were working on a dish targeting provision, somebody who works for another one of the um, hospital organizations actually said to me, you know, you're completely right, and we're going to oppose you and oppose you and oppose you. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's the always when money's on the table, policy doesn't always equate with money. Well, I, I think it was in an NAPH meeting that I heard that uh, the numbers may not be exactly right now because, you know, memory fades, but uh, that Alabama was getting a hundred million in dish and the whole state of Colorado was getting like three million. And I was like, wow, what's wrong with that picture? Uh, and uh, so we worked with NAPH. They actually helped us write the uh, legislation. Um, and it was very funny because uh, when we started to work on this, the person at the Joint Budget Committee, which is really the powerful group at the Colorado legislature, uh, the one, one legislature, Slate Tour, who lived in rural Colorado, said, my dish is the cocaine of public hospitals, and it is my job to keep you from becoming addicted. So one summer day, uh, when they were out of session, uh, I drove down to this very remote little town called Swink, which says it all, in uh, southeast Colorado with our CFO and to take this guy to lunch. And we walked in and we said, um, you know, um, hi, we'd like to take you to lunch. She said, well, why are you down here? I said, we want to take you to lunch. She said, no, but really, why? Why are you down in this part of the state? I said, we drove down to take you to lunch. So go to lunch, the only place where you can have lunch in Swing. And uh, he said, so why are we going to lunch? I said, we want to talk about dish. He said, I hate dish. He said, yes, but by the time lunch is over, you're going to love it as much as we do.
and he was the legislator who introduced the DISH legislation change in the next Colorado legislative session. And Eddie Page really helped us get, get the facts, get the data, you know, not, not impressions of it being cocaine to the public hospital. That then as now, I have to uh, keep the hospitals together. I cannot tell you the important role that New York City hospitals played in the planning of the Affordable Care Act when I was chairman of Ways and Means. Uh, people who were willing to put their differences aside to see what would be best for the country. And with DISH, it was the same thing, whether the hospitals would be the beneficiary or not. They all came together solidly behind what made sound uh, budgetary as well as health sense. It made sense then, it makes sense now that uh, if someone is going to do the right thing and in the long run save lives and save money, you should encourage that type of behavior rather than say, turn your back on the people that want to do the right thing. At the age of 18, I started working for Blue Cross and Blue Shield immediately out of high school, uh, which was a good thing because I had the health insurance that I needed as a young person to start my family. Um, was always covered, but then the company downsized after being there 18 years, and then this is when my whole life changed. I never thought that I would be a person that would need government assistance. So I, I didn't need it at the time until 2007 when I found the cancerous lump in, in my chest, and I had to have my treatment. If I wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be alive today. So. I had to apply for the government assistance of Medicaid, and thank God they was there for me. My youngest child, his name is Caleb, uh, he's 14 months now, and uh, when he was born, they do a blood test for all infants before they're released, where they found that my son has a condition, it's a genetic disorder called biotendasis. What it is is basically, from my understanding, it's an enzyme dis deficiency that he has where his body has a lack of enzymes that can't break down the vitamins in order for him to, his body to retain the vitamins. So every time he urinates, he actually uh, discharges all the biotin in his system. And so he has to take a supplement every day. If he doesn't get the supplement and he doesn't have the treatments and watch on a daily basis, he will start forming alopecia, um, blindness, deafness, seizures and then ultimately death. If my son wasn't covered with the Medicaid, if he didn't have any health insurance, he probably would not be alive because we would not have been able to afford all the blood tests and all the blood work. When Bill Clinton became president and when he appointed the then First Lady Hillary Clinton to develop a health reform bill, it was an incredibly exciting time for NAPH for its membership. Ensuring that everyone has access to care, has health insurance, has always been important to NAPH. And so it was very exciting to see a president and a first lady take this initiative. Books and books have been written about how they didn't do the right approach, it was top-down driven. All of that is true. It was still fascinating to see. On the Hill, when legislation was moving, um, my memory's gonna blank a little, but I think it was two nights a week, we would all meet advocates working for health reform in then the Senate Health Committee hearing room, and people like Senator Kennedy, Senator Daschle, other people would come and tell everybody where things stood, what they were trying to get across. Remember also, the city was not quite as partisan as it is today. We would also have meetings with people like Bob Dole and Senator John Chafee who were trying to get something done, albeit a lot smaller, but still trying to get something done. So this undercurrent of, you know, we're going to solve the problem of the uninsured, so you have to understand that there'll be a, you know, a different role for the safety net. It's the same of the, some of the same rhetoric that we, you know, had happened after Medicaid. NAPH decided two weeks ago to endorse the major principles and key provisions of President Clinton's Health Security Act. It is not that we believe that the President's proposed bill is perfect or that it cannot be improved. 
that it is essential that you understand as you debate health reform that the importance of these hospitals and health systems extends to the services they provide to their entire communities and not just to the poor. For example, they often serve as the only provider of many costly specialized medical and public health services such as trauma care, burn, neonatal intensive care, and so forth. One of these dated Tuesday, January 18th was headlined a tidal wave of the walking wounded. It refers to the extraordinary services provided to thousands of California earthquake victims by the hospitals of the Los Angeles County Health System generally, and in this case, the county's Olive View Medical Center in particular. And I think you can see from the photograph the row after row of emergency patients who are being treated in the hospital's parking lot. The second article, dated January 7th, headlined, Girl Beats Odds After Devastating Ski Run Accident, uh, describes Brooke Siebold, who was a 12-year-old girl, the daughter of a Texas physician. Brooke was brought by air ambulance from Vail, Colorado, to the state's only level one trauma center at Denver General Hospital with a severely lacerated liver, other multiple injuries, and a less than 5% chance of survival. Two weeks later, she walked out of Denver General after a remarkable team of 20 physicians and a brand new trauma center saved her life. The point of these examples is that even if health insurance is available to pay for the specific care provided to Brooke Siebold and many California earthquake victims, health insurance alone will never adequately pay the substantial standby costs of these essential systems and services. These services are available only because they are currently supported by a fragile web of funding sources, including local taxpayer subsidies, Medicare and Medicaid disproportionate share and teaching adjustments, and a very limited amount of private sector cost shifting. And these stories are not isolated or unique. In just the last year or two, we have seen many other examples of the need to preserve such essential standby services, from Hurricane Andrew to the Midwest floods, to the World Trade Center bombing, to the Los Angeles riots, to the recent measles epidemic in Milwaukee. NAPH member hospitals have for many years served as the most essential providers in their respective urban communities, playing this role despite facing many fiscal and administrative obstacles. So remember, after the health reform debate, the Democrats lost control of Congress. And then we got into a Medicaid block grant fight, both houses of Congress passed a block grant bill to block grant the Medicaid program. NAPH opposed that, worked very hard to oppose it. Depending on the state, uh, the proposal for a block grant says to the state, this is how much money you have, and next year you'll have this much, maybe a little more, the year after a little more, uh, but whether that amount is going to be enough is unknown, and there's a lot of reason to worry that the level of the block grant couldn't uh, keep up with the growing health care needs, it couldn't deal with uh, an AIDS epidemic, it couldn't deal with an economic downturn when the number of people who need support uh, goes way up. A block grant is a formula fixed in advance. The current Medicaid design is a match that goes up or down depending on the need. It's a very different way of thinking about how to finance the program. So those were the types of things that you both needed to educate Congress about and also, quite honestly, educate the membership. We know that our members tell their own stories even better than we can. And it's really important for them to have a strong voice, not only at the federal level, but also in their state and in their local communities. State officials really need to understand the reality of what the safety net hospitals do. Uh, the precarious funding situation, the complexity of the populations, the fact that there are many people who even under the Affordable Care Act will remain uninsured and they're going to need to get their care somewhere, the importance of integrating uh, public health and population health goals with uh, direct delivery of services. Those are all issues that NAPH works on and state officials uh, need to understand the reality on the ground. That's absolutely one of the really critical roles that our association can play, is to help our members understand where the incentives are and how to move forward. And at the same time, we play a critical role with policymakers and regulators to say, you know, that direction's not going to work until you change this other policy. There's a lot of bumping around into the regulatory furniture, so to speak, as we kind of all feel our way through this dark room. But, you know, hopefully there's a light at the end of the tunnel on the other side.
Today, after almost a century of trying, today, after over a year of debate, today, after all the votes have been tallied, health insurance reform becomes law in the United States of America. I'm signing this bill for all the leaders who took up this cause through the generations. Teddy Roosevelt to Franklin Roosevelt. From Harry Truman to Lyndon Johnson. Bill and Hillary Clinton. Today, I'm signing this reform bill into law on behalf of my mother, who argued with insurance companies even as she battled cancer in her final days. I'm signing it for 11-year-old Marcellus Owens, who's also here. Marcellus lost his mom to an illness. She didn't have insurance. He couldn't afford the care that she needed. So in her memory, he has told her story across America so that no other children have to go through what his family's experienced. We are done. Chris Birch called me, I think it was the day after the president actually signed the legislation and shared with me that she had been there. And what a moment that was, because she, I think she was even sitting in the front row, um, to see the president sign that. And I, I recently um, spoke at a leadership day for the incoming class of Masters of Public Health students at UC Berkeley. And I shared with them um, how incredibly fortunate they are, even though it's a very daunting task, that their job as the next leaders in healthcare and in public health is to make healthcare reform work and make it meaningful. And I said that they needed to understand that the whole generation before them, and even the generation before that, spent their entire career trying to get healthcare reform. And I really think it's true, the next generation of healthcare leaders are not gonna spend their whole career trying to get health reform. We got it, it's here. Their job is to make it real, <laughs> on the ground, make it meaningful, make it make the difference in people's lives that it has the potential to make, and in the life of our nation. And so I think that it's, a, it's just a very powerful shift. And I think Chris and many of the leaders of NAPH have been part of that generation that worked so hard to make health reform happen. And what's exciting is to see the next generation of leaders emerge that are gonna have to make it real and that are gonna look back in 10 or 20 years and say, well, this is what was possible and this is what we actually achieved. So I, I think that that's very exciting. So the association had talked about changing its name on and off for a number of years. This wasn't a new discussion here. But in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, it really became imperative. There were a lot of people out there after health reform saying, well, why do we need these hospitals to care for the most vulnerable anymore? Well, we fixed this problem. We get, we're giving everybody insurance coverage. Well, why should we support these kinds of places? We need to send a very strong message that these aren't just any other kinds of places, that they are different that they are doing things that others are not doing and can't do. And if our hospitals weren't there to provide the services, the community would do without. And it just comes back to essential. And I think one of the things you're hearing here is that this is putting our members first. We consciously didn't call ourselves an association anymore. We wanted to send a very strong signal that this is about a group of organizations of mission-driven hospitals and health systems who had uh, you know a calling that others didn't have and that's why we really you know went more towards a name that focuses on America's essential hospitals not this or that association or league it's a very conscious decision uh, to put that forward so when people saw us they saw what our members do every day we know essential hospitals have been innovators and engaged in their communities since the day they first opened their doors. But I think what is sometimes challenging is that there are these expectations built into the Affordable Care Act, but not necessarily the supports behind them. So we may be expected to take care of populations of people, but we didn't actually see increased funding to fulfill that duty. 
there's a number of places where there's sort of this skip, start, stop, halt, a little bit lack of clarity as to what we're supposed to do and what resources we're given or not given to go forward. There's a lot of lack of clarity and, and this is very much a work in progress. Anybody who thinks health reform is over doesn't get the fact that it's just, just starting. The only certainty is going to be change you know, over the next 10 or 20 years. And what this system looks like, whether it's around quality, around payment, uh, around just the voice of the patient, uh, we'll see how that, how that unfurls. We think it will hopefully go in the right direction, uh, but it's really a very, very uncertain situation. We think we know in the Congress, and that's why we're going to need you to continue to tell us how we can be fine. There's going to be bumps along the road, but you don't repeal, you improve. I think of the ACA as the rest of healthcare catching up with essential hospitals. Most uh, people, most consumers in America, don't realize what the ACA says or does around quality. And in some ways, that's perhaps some of the most far-reaching provisions of the law around quality. So essential hospitals are innovators. And not just innovators in terms of medical technology or intervention. They are innovators with their communities and with their patients. So far more than other hospitals, essential hospitals have really looked at how they can connect with patients and their families and the communities that they serve and take care of the whole patient. Uh, my name is Brian Jack. I grew up in Massachusetts. I always see myself as a doctor first, and a teacher, and then a researcher, uh, and now as the chair of the department. Um, I really see it as my time to give back to some of the young, talented people who are in our department. Uh, and the experiences around Project Red have uh, really um, allowed me to talk to very many people around the country about what makes patient safety work patient safety projects and health services projects work within the context of safety net hospitals and others. These presentations all over the country and people afterwards will say, raise their hands, say, you know, my Uncle Joe really could have used this, or my grandmother really could have used this. And, and I know too, my parents are in their 80s, and it's remarkable how easily they are confused about these medicines. But maybe it's not so remarkable because it's confusing to everybody. You know, and then different doctors are saying different things, and then they end up taking the wrong thing going back to the hospital. So there's enormous amounts of money uh, on the table that can be, that, uh, that, that can be uh, saved and that the uh, federal government has simply done the math and that showed that we can, we can save enormous amounts of money and provide better services for patients. Uh, and that's what Project Red does. When I was a resident, if you had a hernia, a hernia surgery, if you had cataract surgery, that was all a week in the hospital. Now it's day surgery. So if you're homeless, who's going to bring you to your surgery? And then remember, somebody has to pick you up after you've had your surgery anesthesia. And we found that homeless people were not getting these simple but very important procedures. We, uh, you know, as those things evolved, the shelter community and I think the medical community all start to realize that the people that are ending up on the streets and in the shelters really were suffering from an undue burden of medical, mental health, and, and co-occurring substance abuse problems. And that to, to keep those systems in siloed different healthcare systems that are paid differently, different rules, was really not working. We raise issues. And we, you know, find problems, but we also find solutions. And I think that's been really some of the power of America's essential hospitals, that we just don't go and say, here's a problem, fix it, or here's a problem, uh, give us more money to make it go away. We say, here's a well-thought-out approach. Uh, people like Beth have led on this, to how we can make this situation better uh, in a way which all of you realize at the end of the day uh, is the right way to go about doing it. We have created systems that need to be replicated by the rest of the industry because our focus really is not on our inpatient side of the house any longer. It's really on outpatient types of care in the community, uh, patient-oriented care uh, that really makes a, a, 
a major difference, not only for the individuals that we treat, but for the, the well-being of our, our communities. We in the neighborhood never thought that we'd see the day that we could feel just so proud of the quality of health care uh, that is now made available to all of our citizens. Um, the staff are committed to providing high quality care to the patients here. And so I believe that um, it's, it's unique in that um, there's, there's a real willingness to take the best care of the patients and provide the highest level of care. And everybody, everybody truly cares about every patient that enters uh, Boston Medical Center. It's, um, it's really, I, I think, an honor uh, to be a part of a safety net. Uh, this is the first safety net hospital I've ever worked in. Uh, but I can, I can see the difference in the delivery of, and the caring uh, that um, the clinicians give to the patients. It's, it's a different dynamic than you get in some of the other institutions. We are in the storytelling business. That's what we do. Either we here in Washington tell stories to our leaders and our policymakers about the challenges and the things that need to be overcome to make sure health and health care are better. Um, or we are even better we're actually helping our members, the, the leaders, the doctors, the nurses, all those people tell that story in their community as well as Washington. So I think we do justice to our patients and uh, the, the patients that our members serve by sharing their stories and talking about the human side and the human face of healthcare. And you know, this kind of conversation like we're having now and, and all the work that's led up to this is helping us to tell that story uh, and to make sure it's there, uh, not only today, but for many years to the future. Because these struggles aren't over. And this history uh, and this understanding of where we are and where we're going uh, needs to be kept alive as a living history as we continue to tell the story. You know, we went into this profession to take care of others. What better way than to be at a safety net hospital? We are change agents, not only to our local communities, but to our nation.